Hi, my name is Sophia Ortiz, and this year I am studying elementary education. So before I begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I am a senior at Frisco High School. I am also a second year ISM student. Last year I was studying pediatric nursing, and after going through my mentorship and stuff, I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I was dealing with pediatrics, so it was kids and, and stuff like that, and I realized that I wouldn't be able to handle having patients dying or having to tell parents that their kids were really sick or having to deal with all of that just because it would cause too much pain for me and I didn't want death to become a part of my life either as a nurse. So I just decided that that wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. And so then I was talking to my parents and stuff and my mom was like, why don't you do teaching? And then she told me that when I was younger, I would set up this imaginary classroom and I had a whiteboard and I would set up all my teddy bears and my little sister was kind of in the middle of all of them and I would just teach them everything I learned in school that day. So I'd come home from school and the first thing I'd do was go to my classroom and I'd start teaching them everything I could remember. And so I went ahead and did education this year and I'm so happy I did because I love it so far. I'm also from South America in that little tiny country that the arrow is pointing to. That's where my family's from. And, that, and so growing up, I spoke both English and Spanish. And I remember when I started school, I knew more Spanish than I did English. And I had a bilingual teacher, and she would, she would speak to us, obviously, in both languages. So that kind of made me feel a lot more comfortable. And I remember being scared because I didn't know English all that well, and I didn't know what was happening, really. And so her teaching us English and Spanish and speaking both of them in the classroom made me feel a lot more comfortable and happy about school. So I've also decided that I'm thinking of going into bilingual teaching or maybe teaching a language in school just because I remember how great that felt knowing that somebody understood and, some, and I could communicate with a person and I could communicate with my classmates and not feel like I couldn't because of the language barrier. I also have one younger sister and those are pictures of us together. She's 11 years old and she's my best friend. She's inspired me to teach kids and she's kind of made my love for kids the, what it is today. And so, yes. And then I love photography and music and that's a little bit about me. Okay, so we were told to pick a quote for this year and my quote is, your profession is not what brings home your weekly paycheck. Your profession is what you're put here on earth to do with such passion and such intensity that it becomes spiritual and calling. And that quote is by Van Gogh. And I really love this quote because I think that it just kind of says what ISM is about. It's, what the quote is basically saying is it doesn't matter how much money you're making or what your job is about or anything like that. It's just that you're doing it with so much passion and so much love that it's just kind of like what you're supposed to be doing. And I think that that's what ISM is and that's what I've learned with education this year and that's what I hope you all have learned with your topics this year. It's just kind of like that's what you're supposed to be doing that's what you were meant to do. And, there's, and it doesn't matter how much you're making or how much you're not making. It's just that's what your job is. Why ISM? Um, I chose to take ISM because I was taking photojournalism my sophomore year and this girl in that class whose name was Kat was taking the class and she would always be working on stuff for it or talking about it and so one day I asked her and she introduced me to ISM and she told me what ISM was all about and so I decided to apply and I completely fell in love with ISM. I've learned so much about professionalism. I have learned how to write a proper email. I've learned how to communicate with adults. I've learned handshakes. I've learned how to do all those things. And I've also grown a lot in my confidence. I used to not be able to get up and talk in front of a class, but now when I have to, I don't dread it as much as I did before. I still get a little nervous, but it's not a big deal like it used to be. And without ISM, I wouldn't have been able to get over that. It also teaches you a lot of practice. You practice for what the real world is, real world is going to be like, and you practice for what a professional field is going to be like. And it also brings us a lot of opportunities. Like I said, last year I was studying nursing, and that's what I thought I wanted to do with my life. So for, if it wasn't for ISM, I would have gone into nursing, I would have studied nursing, and then I would have probably ended up changing my major in college, which would have cost me more money. And, 
I would have had to stay in school longer. So ISM just kind of saved me all, saved me all of that. And it gave me the chance to be able to see that that's not what I wanted to do and that this is what I wanted to do. Some things that we've done in ISM were the business symposium, which I love just because it's before you start your interviews most times. And so you get a chance to go out and talk to different professionals. Even if they aren't in your field, you're still sitting down with an adult and you're still asking them questions and they're asking you questions and you're just kind of doing mock interviews and interviewing them and learning from them and you're learning kind of how to, I guess it teaches you how to not be nervous around an adult and it kind of helps you with that. So then when you do go into your real interviews, you've had those practice ones and so you're not going in blind. You know what to do, you know how to act and it helps you a lot. And then my, and then another thing we do is take a UNT trip. And I remember last year, the first time we went on the UNT trip, I was, I didn't, I hadn't really paid much attention to UNT as a school. But then when I got there, I, I completely fell in love. And I remember afterwards, I called my mom and I was like, I have to go to college. I have to go to college because I just loved how everyone was just walking around and everyone was just really cool and I love the classes and I love the professors and I just love the environment and just kind of like the feel that I got when I was there. And so then this year we went again and I fell in love with it all over again. And so because of those trips, I've actually decided to go to UNT just because it has such an amazing education program, but also just the way it made me felt. And if it wasn't for ISM, I would have never even gone there just because I hadn't thought about it as a school at all for me. But, so yeah, so I, I'm very thankful for ISM for everything that it's given me and all the opportunities. So, my interviews for this year were with Ms. Day, Ms. Durst, Ms. Ludecki, Ms. Nicholas, and Ms. Poehler, and they all work for different districts. They work for Plano ISD and for Sky ISD, and one of them actually is a Legacy Christian Academy teacher. So it was really interesting interviewing her. My first interview was with Miss Day, and she was actually my kindergarten teacher. And so I went back to my elementary school, and I thought I'd interview her. And although she's not a kindergarten teacher anymore, she's now with math specialist. So she goes into classrooms, and she pulls kids out of them and helps them when they're struggling with math and things of that sort. Um, I interviewed her, and she just, I remember when I was younger, she's the bilingual teacher that I had, and so she was an inspiration to me, and I just, I loved being in her class, and I love her as a person, and I think interviewing her was so much fun, and I just, I loved it. And so, basically what she taught me was what I took from the interview was that you have to be a special kind of person to be a teacher. Teachers need to be very patient, especially like elementary school teaching, but even like high schoolers, like let's admit it, we, you need to be patient and you need to deal with a lot. And so she just kind of talked to me about that. And she also talked to me about how if this isn't, if you're not entirely sure about doing this, then don't do it just because there's so many people out there that just do it because they get off days or they get the summer off or they get those vacations and they just do it for that. And then they go into it for the wrong reasons and they end up not teaching properly or not loving what they're doing. So she just kind of talked to me about, is this really what you want to do and are you going, going into it for the right reasons? And so I really love that interview. My next one was with Ms. Durst and she's a third grade teacher. So it was nice to kind of have a grade comparison. She teaches at Allen Elementary here in Frisco and she actually used to be an FBI agent. So it was really nice to just kind of talk to someone who like is doing something so completely different than what she used to be doing. And she talked to me about the FBI and then she talked to me about teaching and she actually compared the two and it was funny because she made it work. But I just, I loved her and I loved everything she taught me and she basically just told me that it's okay to make mistakes and that you have to be confident and you have to, because you don't think about it, you're sitting there talking to a class of little kids and you're like, oh, I'm not going to be nervous, but you're still having to talk to people so you need to just be confident and be fun and be funny and just, just get up there and make mistakes and that's okay, which is basically what she taught me. My third interview was Miss Ludecki and she is a private school teacher. So we talked a lot about the differences between private and public school teaching and LCA is a Christian school so she also taught me about just kind of how she incorporates God into her lessons and how she incorporates her faith and stuff like that into her teachings. Um, I really liked learning about 
what a public school is like versus a private school just because I've been going to public school my whole life. So private schools are really different and I think they're more college oriented. Like for example, she told me that the kids there take something like it's an SAT type th test and like even the kindergartners are taking it. So all through high school they're taking these tests and so when they're seniors and they have to take the actual SAT, they're more than prepared just because they've been taking it since they were young. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then again, she taught me about diff like how she incorporates God into her lessons and stuff. And then she also stressed, don't procrastinate. She basically told me that if you make your lesson plans beforehand and if you're if you stay organized and you have everything ready the way you're supposed to have everything ready, then you shouldn't have a problem with being able to leave after school when you're supposed to or you won't be stressed because everything in your classroom is a mess because you procrastinated and you don't have everything ready. So she just told me to kind of keep everything organized and set and that then the teaching experience will be so much easier for me and the students. My next interview was with Miss Nicolas and she is a teacher at Sparks Elementary. She's the one holding Clifford the Big Red Dog. Um, she, her husband was in some branch of the military, I can't remember at the moment, but based, so she had to do a lot of traveling and she's always been a teacher. So I went on and I asked her, I was like, how were you a teacher if you were traveling? She traveled all around Europe and she traveled around America. And so she introduced to me teaching and traveling and she told me that to be a teacher abroad, you just need to have certain certifications and that you can still teach other students and and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed that interview just because I learned about that and I never thought about being able to teach in a different country like that. And I love traveling, so I think that being able to teach abroad one day would be such an amazing experience and just be able to explore different countries and things of that sort, but still be able to help kids like I want to and be able to keep doing my job. And then she also again stressed that staying organized is very important, that you need to get everything ready beforehand, that your classroom needs to be organized or else it's just gonna be a mess. Miss Polar was my last interview and she was, she's actually who I chose to be my mentor. She works for Weatherford Elementary School, that's the elementary school I went to. So when I went to interview my kindergarten teacher, since she didn't have a classroom, she took me to one of the kindergarten classrooms and that was Miss Polar's class. I fell in love with the kids that day. I fell in love with Miss Polar. I just loved everything about the class and everything and I knew that it, she was just, I knew she was going to be my mentor. And so I went back and I interviewed her before I could ask her to be my mentor. And she started at Weatherford Elementary student teaching for fifth graders and now she's a kindergarten teacher. So she just kind of went and talked to me about the differences between fifth grade and kindergarten. And I remember I walked in and she's like, are you sure you want to be a kindergarten teacher? Because she said the first couple of weeks, a lot of the time you're teaching kids how to go to the bathroom by themselves and how to not that you're not their mom and that they need to go do things by themselves and a lot of them don't know how to tie their shoes so you're just kind of babysitting in a way and you're just kind of teaching them school rules because a lot of them haven't ever been in school before so you kind of have to introduce them to the school environment and introduce them to all of the new rules and introduce them to all of the things that schools need to do and what things they need to get done and so the first couple of weeks it's a lot harder and so she told me that with fifth graders it's not like that at all just because they've been in school for a while, they know how to go to the bathroom by themselves, they know how to tie their shoes, they know how to do all that stuff and they've been in school for a couple of years so they don't need to be introduced to everything like the kindergartners do. And so that was really interesting to hear and just, just kind of see the differences between the two. She also talked to me about student teaching because she, she went to UNT and she student taught at Weatherford. So she talked to me about student teaching and what, it, what you have to do as a student teacher and what that requires and how long you have to do it. And that was interesting just because she's so young so everything was really fresh and everything is still the same. Everything that she's told me is still the same. So that's another reason why I picked her is just because she was so young and everything that she was saying was relevant and I could understand it and she was saying it in a way that it made sense. So I went ahead and asked her to be my mentor and she said yes. So a summary of basically everything I learned in my interviews is just to stay organized, be patient, be outgoing and make mistakes, stay excited, and again, teaching abroad. All right, so my mentorship. Again, my mentor is Ms. Poehler, 
And these are just some things that I've learned during my mentorship. Um, the first thing is positive reinforcements. Kindergartners want to run around and have fun and they're excited all the time and they won't sit still. So a lot of the times you just have to, there's these things called Eagle Awards and there's just this little piece of paper and I remember we had them when I was in elementary school and I'd get so excited because if you got enough you could sit on the stage with your friends and eat lunch with them or you could get a prize on Friday. And so whenever they're acting out, we're like, hey, if you're being good, we'll give you an, um, an Eagle Award. And so they all just kind of sit down and start doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so positive reinforcements are really a great way to just get them to do what they're supposed to be doing. And they also get rewarded for doing the right thing. Another thing we do is whenever they answer a question and they get the question right, we tell them to kiss their brains, <laughs> which at first I was like, that's, that's weird. But basically they just kiss their palm and then they put it up to their head. And they, whenever like, I forget to tell them, they're like, aren't you going to tell me to kiss my brain? And I'm like go ahead and kiss your brain because they just love it. It makes them feel special. It makes them feel smart because they got the question right or they did something correctly. <coughs> Another thing is patience because again, they all want to run around and they want to do all that stuff. And then if one of them goes to the bathroom, everyone has to go to the bathroom. Or if somebody is with Sophia, then all of them have to be with Sophia. And so they're all, they all just kind of want to do whatever they want to do. So you have to be patient and just kind of remind them like, hey, it's okay, like, let's calm down, it's fine, let's do what we're supposed to be doing and then we can go have fun. The next thing is parent-teacher relationship. I never thought about this just because my parents were always so involved with my learning but in my school and stuff like of that sort, but not all parents are that way just because sometimes they can't or they have other things going on, but then that also makes it hard on the teacher because if a student is acting out or they're not doing something right and the teacher has to redirect them and tell them how to do it school-wise, but then they go home and the parent isn't enforcing the same rules, then they're just going to go back to school and keep doing what they aren't supposed to be doing. So having a relationship with the parents and being able to talk to them and being able to tell them what's going on in the classroom or what their student is doing is makes it a lot easier on the teacher, the student, and the parents just because the parent knows knows what's going on, the student knows what they're supposed to be doing and it's being enforced everywhere and then the teacher kind of has an easier time as well in the classroom and she's able to teach everybody properly because she doesn't have to worry about one student not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Another thing is explaining things and taking it slow. We were learning about plants and seeds the other day and one little boy had, we have snack time, and so he had a piece of like a whole wheat sandwich and some of the times they have seeds on them. So he was like, Miss Sophia, and I was like, yes. And then he grabbed his sandwich and he's like, if I plant this, will it grow more sandwiches? And I was like, he's like, cause it has seeds. And so we had to like explain how, no, that's not how that works. And then they got into the whole, well, if I eat a watermelon seed, will a watermelon grow inside of me or like, fruit seeds and then they all just kind of went on this tangent about seeds and it was cool because you could see them understanding what seeds were and then if you plant them and stuff will grow and stuff but then you also kind of have to take a step back and just kind of explain everything again and be like that's not how it works you're not going to be able to grow more sandwiches and so it's really interesting and it's really fun and they're all really funny but you just have to kind of explain things and reiterate them and just kind of take it slow or else they'll go on and just use their imagination and say crazy things. And then the last thing is to have fun. I absolutely love them. They are hilarious, they are adorable, and they are just, they're so much fun. <laughs> okay, so some research assessments that I've done that I think have been very important. The first one was the responsibilities of a teacher. Most of us see a teacher and we're like, okay, you're here to teach us and that's all you really have to do and make sure we don't kill each other. But they do so much more than that and I have come to appreciate our teachers so much more just because there's so much that goes into teaching. You don't only deal with the students, you have to deal with other teachers, with other students, with our parents, with everything. And so their responsibilities are so great. They have so many things to do. They have to make lesson plans. They have to go to different meetings. They have to go to curriculum writings. They have to, they have so much stuff to do, guys. It's not, it's not even. <laughs> and then a lot of them have to counsel, for example, we had one student who grabbed some scissors and he tried to cut another girl and we were like, what are you doing? And he was like, I'm trying to make her bleed so we can go to heaven together. And me and Ms. Polar were like, what's, what, what? what's going on? <laughs> and so a lot of times you have to counsel them and 
figure out what's happening and what's going on and why they're having those thoughts or why they're trying to do those things. And so a lot of the time you have to kind of be a psychologist, a psychologist, am I saying right that one? Sorry psychologist of sorts and you also have to just kind of be there for them and make sure that everything's going okay because a lot of them have really bad home lives and so you just kind of have to watch out for those things as well as teach and have all the other responsibilities and so and you also have to continue to learn just because technology is changing and things are changing and education is changing and the ways you teach students are changing so you just have to kind of keep up with a lot so it's a lot more than you think it is so thank your teachers Thanks, Coach Go. <laughs> okay, and then another research assessment that I thought was really important was the best education schools in Texas. I wanted to stay in Texas for school, so I looked up at which ones had really great education programs, and the top four that I saw that kept coming up was Texas A&M, UT, University of Houston, and UNT. And like I said, I decided to go to UNT just because it's close and I feel like they really have a great education program. But being able to, as a senior, being able to research all these schools and figure out which ones were best and which ones weren't was really great, a really great learning experience and it really just, I don't know, it kind of opened up a lot of schools that I hadn't thought about, like I didn't even know there was a University of Houston and then I started researching it and it was, it's a really great school and it has a really great education program so being able to research all those things and do all that stuff was a lot, was really great for the ISM, for my ISM journey. Okay. My original work was basically a PowerPoint of the three types of learning and the three main types of learning are auditory, kinesthetic, and I can't remember the thing. Visual, thank you. Um, and it was just a PowerPoint explaining those three and the char characteristics of every student because we're all sitting in this classroom or we're sitting in other classrooms as well and our teachers are trying to teach all of us and we're all completely different people. We all have different personalities. We all learn differently. So I didn't understand how one teacher could teach a whole class and everyone could understand what was happening. I did some research and I figured out that those were the three main types of learning. And then, so in my PowerPoint, I wrote down the characteristics of the specific students. So the characteristics of an auditory learner or a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner. And then different lessons and different testing. Because a lot of them like a lot of them take tests differently so if you have a student who's maybe a visual learner you would do something visual to test them instead of doing something where they would have to listen to music or something because that wouldn't help and then different lesson plans to just kind of if they're not understanding something be able to figure out what kind of learner they are and then also have lesson plans that could help them with that and then also Another part of my research was teaching mixed classrooms, so higher and lower level teaching. When I was younger, I was in a GT program, but I would also go to my normal classes when I wasn't in my GT classroom, because that's how it worked in Plano. And so when I went back to my normal classroom, it wasn't a GT classroom anymore, so I was learning everything that the on-level or lower level students were learning. And I remember just being completely bored because I knew that stuff, and I would finish my work, and then I would have nothing to do. So Ms. Poehler and I, that's one of the things we try to do is not have the kids be bored. So we have different drawers and then if a higher level student finishes all their work, they, are, they go to drawer number one and they don't know that that's what the drawers mean, like they're numbered one, two, and three and they don't know that what the numbers mean, they're just like, oh, I'm number one. And so they go to their drawer number one and they take something out and it's an activity for them to do that's on their level. So then they're occupied and they're busy and they're not bothering the other students. And then another thing is mixed backgrounds. You don't, again, you don't know what the student is going through at home and stuff, and that affects their learning as well. Um, another thing I did research on was teaching students with learning disabilities, because there's a little boy in our classroom that has autism, so he has different marks that he has to hit and things of that sort. So I did some research on that, and then also on different types of teaching. This is, can you click the link please? This is the PowerPoint that I made for my original work. And I'm just gonna go through it just a little bit. So again, it's just it just kind of outlines the different types of hearing. So auditory is your you hear when you you like to hear things when you're learning. Visual is seeing things, kinesthetic is touching things. So for like an auditory learner, these are like the characteristics. So they rather listen and have things explained to them. They don't enjoy having to read material to learn it, and they find music 
helps memorize and learn materials. So then I also outlined some traits. They're good at explaining, they enjoy music, they read slowly, can't stay quiet for a very long time, and they're very good with names. And then I included teaching methods, so like an auditory learner would like to watch videos or have group discussions or recording lectures and then, have, and then listening to them later on when they can't remember certain things. And then I also outline some tests. So the best test for an auditory learner would be answering questions to lectures they have previously heard or having oral exams. And their worst testing would be reading along passages and having to write answers with a time limit just because that's not how they work. So I made this because I would be able to tell what kind of a learner a certain student was. So if they were having difficulty with something, I would know, OK, well, maybe if we do this, it could help. Or maybe if we tried this way, it would help them understand whatever the lesson was better. Can you go back to the other one, please? It's up there. Thank you. OK. So then, all that research brought me to my final product. So my first idea was to make a year's worth of lesson plans. And I was going to do five weeks worth of lesson plans in one week. And then I was not going to have a perfect classroom. So a perfect classroom means everybody's on the same level. There's no special needs students. Everyone's just, it's the perfect classroom, basically. But I didn't want that, because in my classroom, we have a, a student who's autistic. And then we also have higher and lower level students. And there is no perfect classroom. You're always going to have a classroom with different students and different personalities. But then I started talking to Ms. Polar, and we realized that I was, I was getting five less week, five weeks worth of lesson plans done in one week, but they just weren't quality. They weren't ISM worthy, I suppose, is what you could say. They weren't professional and they weren't looking well. So she was like, why don't you just cut it down to a semester and then you can have less per week and you can um, focus on them and you have more time to work on them. So that's what I did. And so then, I, after we agreed that I was going to do a semester, I went on and looked at some examples of lesson plans. So this is one of them, and this just kind of, it's just kind of to show you guys what a lesson plan looks like. This one outlines every day of the week, and they're done by weeks. And so this one just kind of has what they're, like the time frame and how long everything's going to take and what they're going to do. And then this one is, that one's again for the week, and it just, that one has like art, writing, math, science, and it just kind of a description of the activity that they're going to do, the activity name and like what materials the teachers would need. And then this one is a lot more detailed and it says what activity they're doing, what time frame you need, the day that you're doing it, and it like goes by specifics, what you're gonna do during that time frame and that sort of stuff. So the steps to my final product were first, what are lesson plans? We hear teachers talking about lesson plans all the time, but I had never seen a lesson plan before. And so that's why I went and looked at those examples. And then I talked to my mentor, and she actually gave me some examples. So I went and I researched what lesson plans were. And then I realized that we have to hit something called TEKS, which is Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And so that's basically just a list of things that we need to know by the end of the year and just kind of they're like benchmarks that we need to hit during tests and stuff like that. And it's just kind of basic things. Could you please click the link? Can you scroll down? Yeah, OK. So this is for like kindergarten. So some of the things that they would have to do is like identify a sentence made up of group words or identify syllables in spoken words, um, identify common sounds that letters represent, predict what might happen, next in a text based on the cover, title, illustrations, stuff like that. So these are just kind of points that students in kindergarten have to hit. So as a teacher, when you're making your lesson plans, you have to make sure that all of these things are incorporated because this is what they're going to be tested over. So if you don't incorporate these things and if you're not hitting these things, then when they're tested, they're not going to know what they're supposed to be doing or what's going on. Can you go back? <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> That's your, this, that one, yeah. All right, so then after I had my TEKS down and I had chosen which ones we would be doing in a semester, I went on to look at some special needs requirements. And my teacher told me that for our student who has special needs, basically what she did was create a, created a plan for, with like his parents and the specialists at the school, and she told them what, because his benchmarks are going to be different than the student's, than the, I guess, on, 
than the not special needs student benchmarks. So he has to hit different points and his work is a little bit easier just because he doesn't have